the training division, Texas A&M. Uh, you see it right there. We'll just leave it up for a second. And Billy, you say you do. Well, you did about 65 courses. Are they available just to Texas people? What are the criteria for getting in a course? Uh, the the uh, area, area schools that we conduct, mainly on the weekends, are, are pretty much open enrollment to, to anybody. We don't, uh, we don't have any limitations whatsoever on, uh, of any kind on any of our classes. Un unless they book full, then we have, to, mm -hmm. we have problems mm -hmm. like that. Okay, Sam, let me raise a point as we're moving into the, on, on rope rescue. Sure. Again, almost like swimming, you know, people think, well, I've gone out, I've, you know, I bought myself a nice little hat, oh boy, I'm a, I'm a rock climber. Uh, and I've seen situations where you'll come on the scene to do a rescue and two or three guys think that they know how to do rescue and they flung ropes over the side and they're swinging around down and pretty soon you've got three or four people out there you have to rescue. Just being a recreational rock climber does not make you a rope rescue professional, does it? That's right, Rich. Actually, uh, a recreational or recreational rock climbing is a whole different discipline from rope rescue. Uh, the techniques and the equipment are, for the most part, completely different and uh, individuals who uh, are not experienced in rescue techniques should not be attempting to rescue other climbers. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think you see that. I mean, the natural response if there's climbers around is to go do something. Certainly. We see that in all aspects of rescue, mm -hmm. uh, trench rescue, building collapse, uh, swift water. Uh, we always arrive on the scene with someone attempting to do something. That's a natural... Uh, yeah. Uh, state of things. Yeah. Okay, let's take another call. Another Texas call. You know, Billy, I think you've got yourself an audience right. out here. Right. Clarksville, Texas. Robert Long. Go ahead, sir. You're on the air. My question is on the agriculture rescue. I'm with a small fire department. I'm the training officer here. Our equipment is just the jaws of life, the ram, and the cutters. On that type of equipment, could we rescue people under agriculture? without having to call in extra equipment? Uh, some types of equipment, yes, you can. Uh, I w well, I, what I'd really suggest to you is getting with your implement dealers and, and have him go through some of the different types of equipment because some of the equipment that you have is not going to be able to cut through some of the hardened case uh, metals. In that case, probably some of the best tools you'll ever use out there is probably just basic hand tools, wrenches, ratchets, so forth like that which are easily obtained. Also, if you're on a farm, I mean, to my experience, the man whose farm it is has some tools. Oh, Would sure. it be a good idea to maybe check around and see if you can use some of the things that are at hand right there? Sure. Uh, have your equipment resources well planned out. Uh, use whatever is available. Uh, a lot of times the uh, people there on the farm have their own equipment there. Uh, once again, getting back to this farm implement dealer, putting him on call and having him respond because they do it on a regular basis, go out and make service calls on the equipment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Long, what else can we help you with? Uh, uh, how large is your squad, sir? We have 30 volunteers and six paid men. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, have you had occasion to run some calls like this, sir? At this time, we haven't had any problem with that. We've had some problem with the tractors catching on fire. Hmm. Now, let's, let, let, let me ask a, 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 a question about that, because again, you're dealing, you may be towing pesticides, sure. you may be towing in silage, you may be towing anything that has the potential for a rapidly spreading fire. Right. You also may be in a field where you could start a heck of a brush fire and be entrapped in the process of that too. So there are larger hazards here that we're talking oh, about, aren't abso there? Absolutely. You always have to be... Uh, aware that most of the time when harvest, harvest time is, most of this stuff is dry and the potential for fire hazard is very great. So having adequate fire protection there is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had a call from a caller and I'm going to dip deep down and if any of y'all want to help me out on this, you're a paramedic. A caller asked about uh, uh, crush syndrome. As I understand it, there's two aspects to it, one of which is that over a period of time after you've crushed tissues, they release certain toxins and at a certain point uh, releasing the patient releases those and the, you become immediately and very seriously septic. The other is blood pressure changes as you auto infuse yourself or auto uh, uh, 
transfuse yourself and once you release it again you have a massive dilation of your vascular system and you crash out your blood pressure crashes those are the two things I can think of and help me out with this you're 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 better at this than I am well I, I haven't had much experience with dealing with the crush zone the crush syndrome some of the things to consider though when when an extremity or the full body yeah. is crushed one of the things we've got anaerobic metabolism going on right. with a buildup of lactic acid in the body and once we release that that to whatever it is that large object on there then we have an infusion of lactic acid right. as, back into the system that could create some uh, dysrhythmia. Metabolic some, shock uh, actually is about what it is. Yeah, isn't exactly, it? Yeah. Exactly. The other is the compartment, actually well, the other one is the compartment syndrome where you uh, have a collapse of your blood pressure. We could, that could yeah. be in just one extremity right. or, or whatever but we we do have that when mm -hmm. when the vessels break open you leak out into the into the system, the pressure drops, and, and we've got a serious problem mm -hmm. to deal with there. Too. Yeah, the bottom line, caller, uh, and again, uh, thank you for the question, is that you're dealing, in essence, with a very serious advanced life support situation in most of these cases. So you probably are going to want to plan to have ALS, if you don't have it in your community, to get the helicopter started, to get life flight or whatever it is on the way. By the time you get the patient out, you're going to need advanced life support, even though it may seem to be a minor situation from the start. That's probably a good rule of thumb, wouldn't Absolutely. you think, Tim? We would like to have uh, ALS on the scene immediately, cardiac monitoring, in position, yeah. uh, taking a look at any changes in the monitor that we might have, uh, an IV started before we remove, mm -hmm. if possible. If it's in the best interest of the patient to move rapid transport, we would like to have all that in position before we move those objects off of our victims. Yeah, good point. So consider ALS as part of your planning immediately. Also, I think in agricultural incidents Absolutely. for the same kind of kind of reasons. And in rock incidents where you have, say, an injury where the rope has been wrapped around a limb for a period of time, you've got all kinds of complications there, wouldn't you think, too, Sam? Sure, and, and uh, crush injuries are also potential sure. because of falling uh, rocks and mm -hmm. in earth and, and so forth. Yeah. So there's serious medical components to all Absolutely. of these. Uh, Keith Heinke, or Keith Henke, excuse me, in Frederick, Maryland. Go ahead, Keith, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Sure. I'm glad to be on the show. Um, glad to see all you together here. I have a question for you as well as Captain Turner in regards to uh, rope rescue. Uh, it's a three-part question in that could you elaborate more on what a incident commander should do before the specialty team arrives on the scene? And then once the specialty team, in this case a rope rescue team, arrives on the scene, what the incident commander should do is far as integrating them into the rescue mm -hmm. situation and then if you can elaborate any further on like helicopter operations in a rope rescue incident. Sam, go ahead. This is well, uh, the first thing you need to consider is control of the scene. You've got to look at what your problems are. Uh, you're bound to have problems uh, unless you're in a very isolated area with, uh, with bystanders. You want to make certain that uh, those bystanders are uh, away from the scene. Uh, normally or often you're going to be dealing with a situation where you've got a lot of people looking over the edge of a, uh, a cliff or hillside mm -hmm. down at a victim and so you have the potential for uh, added uh, debris and uh, injury to the victim. Once you've controlled the scene and have a good handle on what the problem is, when uh, the rescue team arrives you want to apprise them of uh, what you have and, and then pretty much turn it over to them and get them to uh, put you to work doing things that you can do uh, with the expertise that you have. Mm -hmm. in, in essence then would, would the on-scene commander once the rescue team goes to work actually be more important providing additional resources as right. opposed to telling, okay, do this, do that, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, but that's, a, I guess, Keith, and, and are you involved in a team right now, Keith? Uh, yes, sir. Tell, County. tell us how you run it. Uh, we just uh, formulated a, an advanced technical rescue team with uh, the near, uh, Harpers Ferry being so near, Sugarloaf mm -hmm. Mountain in this area. We've had some overland rescues, and we're just starting, starting to get started, basically, and uh, we're just trying to uh, expand our role within Frederick County and so on. Uh, and what we're really, really interested in is uh, helicopter operations to uh, evac the patient out of a uh, basically a wilderness type of uh, a rescue. Let me let me call on Sam again for a minute. Can you elaborate a little more on the on the role of the helicopter in incidents like well, this? Well, in terms of helicopter operation, normally the helicopter crew is trained and uh, has the equipment necessary to do their part of the operation. So really, the key here 
is to uh, direct them in and then provide communication so that they understand what the extent of your problem is, uh, where your victim is, and uh, what has been accomplished uh, to this point. Keith, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Let me ask you one other question because you have an interesting combination in Frederick County, which is just a little south of the Emmitsburg campus. That is, you've got a large river, the Monocacy River. How do you coordinate your river rescue and your high angle rescue? Is that a sim single team or how do you handle that? Well, at this time, we don't uh, perform any uh, swift water rescue, mm -hmm. and, and yet we're still seeking some training and, and using the ropes and possibly, you know, doing it like a high line or, or in some instances where, where it dictates. But basically right now there's uh, companies that basically have boats and they just do their water rescues wow. uh, with boats and so on, mm -hmm. but we haven't really integrated with them yet. Mm -hmm. But the county is divided up, so there are people who do one and people who do the other. Absolutely. Good point. Also, I understand you also use, in some cases, the resources of Montgomery County to the south and your neighbors to the north, Adams and Franklin County, Pennsylvania. So it's a, a nice working relationship, isn't it? Absolutely. We've been very fortunate with the mutual aid uh, PACs in this area mm -hmm. to call upon uh, Montgomery County's set team. And uh, like you said, uh, Shippensburg has a team in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Baltimore County also has one in this area. Okay, Keith, thank you very much for calling and we appreciate that. Okay, Listen, thank you. real quick, guys, we're going to have to get out of here, but let me just go down the line real quick. What is the one key thing, if you were going to leave somebody with one idea about serious technical rescue from your standpoint, what would it be? Sam, let's start with you. It would definitely be get training from qualified instructors, understand the capabilities of the equipment that you have, and practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Billy? Know your limitations. Uh, know how to protect yourself, know how to take care of yourself so that you don't become a victim. And Tim? I'd say the same thing that, matter of fact, all of our presenters have said today, training. We need to get competent instructors to train us for what we're going out to do. Understand the hazards, uh, the type of operations we're getting ourselves into, and then just be real smart, heads up about going out and doing these rescues. Okay, thanks a lot. We thank, thank you. you, appreciate the panel. We appreciate all your calls. Time's up though, we've got to move on here. We've got some information that emergency response teams, firefighters and police officers may be interested in. There is a video now available showing how to respond to accidents involving horse trailers and horses, something we don't consider but we may have to deal with. It's called Equine Trailer Rescue. It's produced by Video Knowledge Incorporated of New Jersey. It teaches basic horse handling skills as well as specific restraining methods and extrication techniques. The tape, approved by the American Association of Equine Practitioners, is available for $59 from Video Knowledge. The address is 25 Applegate Street in Red Bank, New Jersey, and the zip code is 07701. Or by calling 908-842-5832. Three, seven. That's for your equine uh, rescue tape. Now, your recommendations for us, little horse sense for us, for improving these shows are totally invaluable, and we want to hear from you about that. Here's the person to write to, Sue Downen. She's the executive producer of ENET. You can write to her at the National Emergency Training Center, 16825 South Seton Avenue in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and the zip code is 21727. Now, if you would like to buy any of the ENET broadcasts from 1989 to the present, you can do so by calling the, or contacting the National Audiovisual Center. And there's the address. It's pretty complicated up on the screen. It's in uh, Capitol Heights, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Two telephone numbers for you to call, 1-800-788-6282 or their regular number if you can't get the 800 number is 1-301-763-1896. Now copies of broadcasts for our shows can be obtained on loan also from your state emergency management or FEMA regional offices. And to get those tapes or to buy tapes before 1989 call the ENET office. Now, if you have any questions about ENET for 1993, the rest of this year, please feel free to call the ENET office up in Emmitsburg. That number is 1-800-527-4893 or 301-447-1068. Now, finally, for those of you involved in the ongoing flood emergency in the Midwest, here's a new source of official information. FEMA has established DC-1, it's called the Disaster Channel 1. It's currently providing national level news feeds for Midwest flooding, including the latest federal reports of disaster assistance being made available. 
DC-1 is broadcast from FEMA headquarters, and here's the satellite setup. C-band, Galaxy 7, Transponder 23, and on the KU band, SBS 6, Transponder 6. The news feeds and update segments will be transmitted daily from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time for the duration of the flooding. And just briefly right now, there are seven states with declared disasters, over 25 disaster application centers in place. Uh, here is a telephone number for you, 1-800-469-9029, 1-800-469-9029. Uh, to register as a disaster victim if you're affected, 1-800-462-7585 for the hearing impaired. If you have information or if you need donations or want to give donations, actually, mainly money. People there need money. They don't need left shoes or single gloves or things like that. They need money. And that number to get information about where to donate is 1-800-634-7089. There's over 800 FEMA employees out there in the Midwest now working, plus personnel from 26 other federal agencies, plus the American Red Cross. The folks out there need all the help they can get, and they certainly have our prayers and support. This was our 100th show. We thank you for your support. With your support, we'll do 100 more. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. I'm Rich Adams.